Hey everyone, um, th thanks for coming. Long term uh, listener, first time speaker, so uh, this will be fun. Okay, so t today I'll be talking about tickets and other fun stuff. So firstly, who am I? I'm a, I guess, SIEM engineer I, with a background in uh, data networking, Cisco, firewalls, that sort of stuff, and I guess an interest in analytics. Um, my interest in travel hacking and, and travel stuff uh, relates to, I guess, when I first moved into state for work. And, you know, I, I used to always like check in 24 hours before the flight. I was like, damn, how come I can't select these front seats? Like, you know, I like, I was like, this is the second, like, who's beat me to it? And then you kind of find out that like things are actually reserved. And then you learn a bit more about how the, how different airlines and other things have, like, have status and then their clubs and all the, all the other fun stuff. So I guess that, that's what really sort of built my um, uh, interest. And then living overseas, I used to fly a, a, lot, a lot. So having said that, what, what, what is this talk not? So what you often see on um, blogs and things like that is these, these sort of outlandish things where it's like, oh, how do I flew the largest, you know, the largest top flexible price for something first class for like nothing, right? And what you, when you end up, when you start to read the articles and you get through it, you, what you find often is it's, ah, oh, they just got a credit card sign up bonus and here's some miles. So in, in the case of this, this article, they didn't actually have an affiliate link, but a lot of them is, I guess, affiliate marketing, right? So anyway, and with that, I got a, just a quick disclaimer. Um, this is obviously for ethical security reasons to help, help people in those teams uh, fight and prevent uh, Ensure revenue integrity. So, us in socks, uh, in in sock teams, we often have some extra analytical capability that that does add for things like fraud and, and whatnot that are uh, value. So, similarly, just some caveats from this talk. So, I haven't worked in this industry. This is just me playing around and my fun, you know, things I've learned over time, just to share with everyone here. Um, so. It's not 100% accurate, like it's, it's just black box reverse engineering. Um, so why is the airline industry the way it is? Essentially, it's, it's highly regulated. Um, there's bilateral agreements between, <laughs> between um, states and they control how much traffic you can have, uh, have. They have the things called the freedoms of the air. There's sort of five known um, from international treaties. Like for passenger, passenger ones, there's Generally, it's to carry between your home state and, and another state. But there's also an interesting one called the fifth freedom, where uh, it stops over into, in an intermediary location. It can pick up and drop off people. So what you actually see, so one of the ones, a good example of this is the Emirates flight to New York that stops in Milan. So the Emirates are able to sell New York to Milan as a segment and divide Milan to a segment, as well as the, the straight to New York with a stopper, with a um, transit. Um, in terms of... Um, in terms of marketing uh, and cheap affairs, you often find that airlines will charge more for a direct flight. And this is because of things like business travels, travelers and people's, uh, just people's preferences. And competitive attacks often are against, like, uh, against other competitors' home ports. So you see things like the, it might be against London Heathrow by the, Star, the Sky Team Alliance, where they'll be pushing people through Paris or or Amsterdam or whatnot, right? So having said that, what is revenue management? So re revenue management is basically, they're trying to extract the most amount of money they can and sweat their assets. They, they want those planes full and they want them to, the, the most amount of money people can you know, get out of you. Um, so it's kind of like similar, in some ways it's similar to a grocery store with uh, uh, perishable goods, except you know people generally have to be somewhere by a time it's rather than, you know, the broccoli is going to go bad. So the things they worry, worry about is, uh, you know, like as I said, overprotection is, is that these are sort of the more technical terms when you look into it, you know, leaving it go empty or too many cheap sheets and it's full and they can't get any more money for it. Okay, so just, so now I'll talk a little bit about how the fair, fairing and fares work. This is a little bit of a, a quick intro, but one key point I guess to raise is that 
especially for international travel or where there's multiple, where there's connections and stuff involved, it ex becomes extremely complex like your fares. So when you're actually searching, you never actually really see a full complete result set because they're sort of CPU limited by like 15 to 30 seconds of CPU time when you reach search. And there's often multiple layers of um, caching or, or caching in involved. Um, so yeah, there's some stats there. I think that's from the Aptco website. There's, there's 351 million published fares. So a published fare, there'll be many for a particular market and destination. So straight from, you know, you would see, be used to seeing things like sale fares, you know, flexi, whatnot, and each of them have different sort of rules and conditions. Um, they're, they're published on, uh, you know, routing or, or max permitted mileage. So example of a routing one is this one here. It's a Los Angeles to San Juan. Um, and these are, the, and then I've got the, the routing options and, and layover locations in there that, that this allowed. Interestingly, just because something's published and it's there doesn't mean it doesn't mean it'll actually work or it's even possible. Like for instance, this one, I think there's no, I don't think American even has an Austin to San Juan direct flight, well, at least not at the moment. So that actually, even though it's published and it's there, it's, it's kind of useless. So similarly, with the permitted mileage base, some people here who've worked with you know detections and impossible travel, whatnot, it's it's that um, great circle distance uh, between the between the different stops, and you have um, and often they have it's a little bit comp they add a little bit more allowance for like say for instance in this example they allow an extra extra allowance of mileage for a transit stopover in Chicago where otherwise it wouldn't meet the the maximum distance. So speaking about, in terms of those fares, there's actually quite a lot of different conditions to take to take um, to consider. So these are some of the more pertinent ones for, I guess, us to, to look into that can cause issues. Um, one of the things that I often hear people say is, "Oh, they put the price of the flight up," and I sort of counter with like, you know, maybe there was uh, advanced purchase restrictions or things like that in place. So often you've some of the discount ones, there'll be like 14, 28, 90 day advanced purchase. And what that means is that, um, yeah, the day that, you know, when you fly, it has, to, it has to be bought, you know, that many days beforehand. So if you just push the, the, the date out to the next day, you can still see maybe that, that the departure date, you, can, you might be able to still access that fare. Um, so how it sort of works, this is sort of my understanding of it all. Um, I guess the key, the key thing, I, the key point I kind of want to make is that um, you're, uh, you're just having a reservation in a system is different from the e-ticket. There's two separate parts and you need that e-ticket to be created and, and valid to actually fly. So that's the actual coupon that you redeem when you, you know, get your boarding pass and board the flight. Um, so yeah, this CRS and GDS systems, you often hear people talk, might, might hear people talk about Amadeus or Sabre. They're kind of the big leaders in the market. And one other little interesting thing is you can often pull up. So if this was a, this relates to this particular ticket here, um, which is a more complex Qatar ticket that had like five different carriers on it. So you can see that all these other airlines, uh, Cathay, Qantas, Qatar, all use the Amadeus system, but there's a different record locator for the synced record in uh, Sabre for American. Um, and so the other picture I have here just talks about the fact that you need that valid e-ticket to be able to actually check in for the flight. So that, that's a valid reservation, but it's missing the, the it's not ticketed yet. Um, so how does it all work with, with money? And, and, you know, I just buy the fare off one and I've this, I have this international one with multiple segments of different airlines involved. And simplified, it it's kind of just looks like this, right? So there's a thing called the validating carrier, um, a marketing carrier and your operating carrier. So you, your validating carrier is the, the one that you know, issues, is issuing the ticket that's it's called like on their stock. It's called, yeah. Um, and that's who you're buying it from. Generally, it's usually the first like uh, international or, or long haul segment. The other ones, your marketing carrier is the, the flight number. So it's usually the same as the one that's operating the plane, but, but sometimes you might have heard a thing called a code share where like you might actually be like, you might have bought it as a British Airways flight or something. And then it's actually, you know, you're traveling on an American flight. So, yeah, and then the way that the airlines control, so this is an important in terms of the way that airlines actually control their dynamic pricing is through 
in, um, inventory buckets. So we talked a bit about the fares. So each one of these fares will, will, will say which in particular piece of inventory they're allowed to book. And you can see here on the, the United side, it, it's actually fortunate enough that it actually tells you which, um, which fare buckets that they align to. It's not always the case on all websites, but the generic, and as you can see, they, um, they don't necessarily align between different airlines. They, they, have, they all have their own which way they like to do it. So generally these, these are like sort of least expensive to most expensive and, and you know, least flexible to most flexible. And often the most flexible ones, say the most flexible in economy, actually might be more expensive than the cheaper, one in business, cheaper ones in business. Um, so what does it actually look like on a GDS? So this is what they actually look like. Um, this is an example of like some people would say the loads or what's available. So what these numbers mean is that's the number of seats available for sale uh, at one time currently on offer. And if you've ever seen on a website, sometimes it might say hurry, like um, five, or, five or less seats are left. It's because you know, the, these buckets are showing like five or less. You're actually seeing a bit in that inventory. Um, why this one is interesting is this is a, this, this, this is a good example of an, it looks like an oversold in economy, but the, the business class and first, it seems to be quite open. So um, the Y zero means it's, it's, not, it's closed and not available. So if you, if you have a you know, high status and you're traveling alone, for instance, you might actually even have a good chance of being, um, of re receiving an upgrade, you know, operational upgrade so they can fill the rest of that plane up with more economy passengers. Um, similarly, when, you, when you're looking at a connect, uh, connections and longer, longer things, what you're looking for is the lowest, so lowest booking class available for both segments. So for instance here, when we look at the, an economy thing, uh, even though while on that first flight, there's Oscar and golf like available, the, your actual lowest is Quebec on there. And then similarly in business, we see under Romeo is there's only one seat left. So if you've got two passengers it would, and you do a search, another search for two people at once, it'll actually bump you up to a higher fare in, in, in Delta class. Yeah. So this, just going back over, this is an old, this is an, an old um, boarding pass of mine that's kind of interesting. You can, you can see some of the things you can see on it. Um, it's the e-ticket number starts with uh, 125, which is the first three digits of these are actually the issuing airline, the database that it goes to. So interesting kind of fact is Americans one is 001 because they, they were the first to have a computerized reservation system. When, and that's a whole other story. But yeah, this shows a couple of other pieces of information of, of unusual sort of things where it's, it's been printed by Aer Lingus, it's on BAE ticket stock, it's a, a code share flight, it's this American flight with a BAE, yeah. It's just tying together some of those concepts, I get, guess. And the, um, that 25 number, I think, is the sequence number. So sometimes you might also see a number that says SEQ. Usually that's the order that um, like, you've checked in or, or it's gone on the manifest when you've done that. So, yeah. So now in terms of talking about some of the vulnerabilities and attacks, so fuel surcharges are probably the most uh, vulnerable element of dynamic pricing, or sorry, of um, pricing in the market now. Uh, they, we introduced started, sort of started with BA, I think, in 2004. Um, in response to some of the oil sort of shocks that were happening at that time, and they wanted an easy sort of lever that they could pull to change like the pricing of multiple fl flights at once. But what airlines have sort of discovered is that um, they didn't have to, they, they weren't, it's like, oh, these are great. It's kind of like hotel or resort fees and stuff you see in, here in Vegas, right? So they, they don't have to pay commissions on it. They weren't paying commissions on it. They weren't, uh, um, they charged them on redemption tickets and all sorts of stuff. So what's, what's interesting is that often you can see, especially on some of these really um, competitive markets, some of these transatlantic flights, the actual base ticket fare is like $1 and then there'll be like $400 of, of surcharges. So if we can beat these, or if they can be beaten, it's, it's quite a vulnerability in their, their system. So the way, they're, the way they're applied is there's these records, uh, the S1 and S2 records in um, sort of like database records that, that apply, like a, kind of like a firewall rule, in the, and that's what this sequence number is. This is a screenshot from of, of one of the, the Travelocity's online um, user guide. And it's showing is showing yet yeah, an application of a surcharge with a sequence number. So how, how can they be beaten? Well, it's 
the key the key fact to know about these is that they're actually the the records uh, relate to the validating uh, sorry the marketing carrier publishes the amount but the validating carrier or the one that issues the ticket is the one that makes the decision on when to like whether they want to apply it or not so back in the old days before there was a bit more restrictions you could actually just go to an, another carrier to issue the to issue a ticket without on and, and completely by, bypass it so that got a little bit harder um, but there's other ways there's, there's still other ways to, to force misprices um, for instance, that point of sale has been an issue for some airlines in the past where because of the local regulations in that country, they might have restrictions or, um, or limits on how much they can charge. And yeah, so this is kind of, this is a bit of an example. This, this slide shows something from the APTCO manual on, as, as part of like, uh, of these, um, these records, right? So this is a subset of, of the rules that can be matched. And if you're thinking like, if you're thinking like a pen tester or you're thinking like someone in our community, you can st start to see some of these where vulnerabilities might creep in with some of these things. So see like on the, for instance, on that last line, if you read that text, um, when the journey is between Seattle and New York and all ticketed points are wholly within the US. So what happens if we have another another segment that's on there that might be like in Mexico or Canada or something on there, right? That that might be a high surcharge, but that's an example of like the logic that the way the logic can be um, broken. So here's an example of uh, this is a example of something that I one of the ones I found quite some time ago. It's heavy, it's a bit heavily redacted, but um, essentially this was a cheap well cheapish uh, international fare for 700 pounds. But the interesting thing about it is that the, um, the, the surcharge amount is like 50, 60%, right? So it's quite a, it's a lower base fare, but this, you got 60% or 55% of it. And how do we, how do we break it? Well, it can be broken with another, like another fare that can be uh, combined with it. So essentially this, this one here has, has has broken those. Basically, it's dropped down the down, down all those rules, and nothing is applied. It's hit the any any rule in the firewall, and it's and we're ho we're home. You know, we're home. But what it has done is because you've added another flight, it's actually added to the base cost of the of the fare. But that increase is less than the surcharges, and that's kind of the the crux of how um, the online sort of community call them um, fuel, fuel dumps. And they'll say like, a, this would be an example of adding a first segment, but people add third and other segments. Um, there's also other ways that, that these things get broken. So say I've, I've seen one in the past where it was like, add this surcharge for first transatlantic segment and this surcharge for, for last transatlantic segment. But when you did a multi-city and you book two back to back, it would only apply it for, on the first and the last. So you've basically got the other one just for the base fare. Um, yeah. So another sort of, Thing to talk about is, is I guess, arbitrage is, is something to be aware of. Um, there are sort of costs and inconveniences associated with it, though. But for instance, um, if you're looking at this this particular business, um, like one of these round the world fairs, you can see like just from Hong Kong to Japan is half, right? Or or you know, United States to Canada is you know 30% or, so, or or so less. So if you think about if you if you plan around that and you know, it might be a little bit out of your way, but you know, something you consider. Um, it's, we've also seen things where um, some countries with more volatile currencies, uh, and when they have fixed exchange rates, like in Egypt, there was a, a case where they, um, you know, they dropped their exchange rate fifty percent, and then yeah. So hidden city ticketing is another thing you might be familiar with. The skip lagged website that went around a few years ago. Um, as you can see, this is this is because this is exploit market dynamics. So it's um, even though it's the same flight for Dallas to Atlanta, they're competing with American on the Dallas to Nashville side, and it's potentially a more leisure market versus uh, um, business market. So airlines don't really like this because it um, it sort of stuffs up their loads and whatnot because people are missing the second segment. Um, but 
I said, don't check, don't try, don't try this too often. I'll try and check a bag on it. Um, so I'll just also touch on mistake fares. So these are the ones you sort of hear uh, online that's like when these first class tickets sometimes, it sometimes makes the press when they get a lot of attention. There'll be a ticket for, you know, um, I think Cathay had some from um, Vietnam to the US for $500 for first class international return. So in the past, these were quite, you, you kind of wanted them, them to touch US soil because of the enforcement of the DOT of the post-purchase post pricing uh, increase legislation. Um, however, there was in 2015, there was a um, United did a, had a divide by 1000 issue where in, when they were issuing fares in Danish krona, the currency separate the decimal point they use in Denmark is actually a comma. So that so led to a divide by a thousand issue with the filing. And they let that run on for quite a while. And then, but basically the DOT has come out and sa saying that they only really want to enforce on bona fide mistakes that, that c consumers have made. Now, my kind of point is that some, some of these, like when we're used to seeing like $1 return based fares to, on some of these transatlantic routes anyway, when is a mistake really a mistake or is it just a sale? So that's why, as Roaring Kitty would say, I just like the fare because um, blogs that promote them, you know, assist, I guess, go go to the point of their demonstrate that's demonstration that it's a mistake, right? If, if, if these blogs label them as mistakes. So I guess in the interest of ethics and uh, the purpose of this talk in terms of how we help or how, how um, security teams that in this industry can sort of help with that, what can they do for detection and response? Now, this is a bit of a black box for me because I, because like I said, I'm, I'm just OS int on everything here. Uh, but the biggest stick they hold that, that's quite sort of public is the ADMs or agency debit memos. So you can actually find the guidelines on, on ADMs. If you just Google, you can find it. But these, these are really, um, they're often used for like attacks that agents would, would or that a abuses and attacks that agents might use on, on things. So that's things like withholding fictitious bookings and just like, like waiting, not ticketing them and then just for a customer and then redoing it as soon as it's time out with so they can extend you know hold a hold a fare without paying for it and, until the customer's ready that sort of thing right so but there's other stuff they could do i mean they could think with us and think like us and look at the cents per mile like like mileage runners do um yeah finally like all right so if you're interested how do you get closer to host closer to this data and, and find out see these numbers and all that sort of stuff so what i can recommend is the gds well, you can't get access to a GDS. You can um, pay for these sort of read-only access through these the services, Expert Flyer and KBS tool. They're, they're, they're pretty good. Um, but the, the better one that I like to use is ITA's Matrix. It's for, for pricing. So you can kind of get the fares and other details from Expert Flyer but, and availability. But Matrix is so powerful to, to, um, to play with. Uh, and the most useful feature I find is actually turning off the availability check to get more and putting more specific things I'm trying to work in it so that I can make the best use of that 15 or whatever 30 seconds of CPU time you get for searching. So I know this was a short talk, but in terms of talking about the, the, all the sorts of attack vectors that these uh, that could be faced by uh, ref management teams, and I mean, they, they sort of range from innocuous to <laughs> outright malicious. So people, you know, people compromising accounts and selling miles or cashing out in gift cards, or just even like, as we said before, just like holding up all their maliciously sort of holding lots of space and then dump, you know, canceling it last minute so that the thing's empty. Um, but it, it's, it's not really an us, it's not always an us first them thing for, for a consumer. Like we get upgrades sometimes, we get all, that, all these nice things. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. So thanks everyone. And uh, I do have a couple of other, I guess, um, resources for some of the people there. I did see some of the uh, people take photos of the slides. So some of these are, are worth a read, especially um, Carl DeMarken, who, who is one of the chief engineers at ITA. He, there's an MIT um, set he does on the computational complexity. And it's really, really interesting, um, yeah. So, yeah, thanks. <laughs>